do you think of George Church's company, Colossal? Uh, is this the um, uh, Woolly Mammoth Company? or? Yeah, the Woolly Mammoth Company. I think there's also a spin out from that uh, form bio. Yeah, so obviously George Church in general is, is you know, really interesting, right? Um, but I think, um, you know, so people people tend to, you know, sort of follow whatever uh, whatever he's doing uh, really carefully. But if you look at his actual track record as an entrepreneur, it's sort of pretty mixed. You know, so I, I don't know what'll, what'll end up happening there. I think a lot of Church's stuff is kind of long on hype and short on substance, which, I mean, look, somebody needs to do it. Uh, Somebody needs to think big about real tough biological questions. And in some ways, he probably wants to be the Elon Musk of, of biotech, right? Um, but uh, biotech is different from tech. It's, it's, it's a lot harder. Progress is slow. It comes, progress in, in biotech kind of comes when it wants to, not when you want it to. And a lot of that has to do with regulatory barriers as well as just, you know, gene therapy, for instance, took a good 30 years before it actually had a success. Uh, nucleic acids uh, took 30 years uh, before it had success, whether it's antisense or now mRNA as well. Um, CRISPR is going to take shorter, it looks like, which is great. Um, but that's just, you know, a nice feature of that technology. Antibodies didn't take that long either. Um, so sometimes technology will go quick, sometimes it'll go slow. In biotech, it's hard to sort of force it. Um, I hope that things will start to go faster in biotech and biopharma, but it's just one of these things when you deal with human health, it's it's really tough to do. I like the idea, though, that I think Church has done this and a few other people have. It might have been Church's other company, as a matter of fact. But one company is doing CRISPR in animals and longevity CRISPR at that. I actually think that's a really good idea because you have far less regulatory issues in animals. And if you can get a dog to live twice its normal lifespan, whatever the heck you did to that dog will also work in humans, almost certainly, right? So uh, at least that's the most biology people would say um and i would i would agree with that so like i think that that's a really cool idea is to just focus on a lot of this stuff in animals and you know this is what biopharma kind of tends to do before going into humans but i think you know some of these problems you can't really solve uh in in humans without sort of serious issues from a regulatory perspective like longevity is just not something the fda is ready to think about and touch uh, but you can do it in animals just for kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it fun, but I guess for, for sort of setting a precedent perspective. What do you think the government should do to get these new drugs, et cetera, into the hands of doctors or patients quicker? It seems far too long for these drugs to get to market. Thank you for your question, Joseph Hallworth. I'm not sure that's true. I think drugs get to the market pretty quickly. I think that the trick is getting more, more medicine out there. And that's the hard part. Like I think about Huntington's, uh, Friedreich's ataxia. Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, those are just four serious, um, often fatal, if not almost all fatal, neuro uh, sort of, uh, I just say, uh, neurological diseases that have really not just no treatment, but also no sort of direction for a treatment. Um, so really, really tough illnesses to think about how to treat. In aggregate, you're talking about many millions of patients who are very, very severely affected. So once an Alzheimer's disease uh, drug comes out, it'll get to patients pretty quickly. And if it takes a few years, it takes a few years. The bigger question is the first real Alzheimer's drug in, a, in forever, in ever, in, I mean, since, since the disease has been discovered, really, uh, will be a huge impact. But who's going to come up with it and when? That's the harder part. So I think the question is, how do we accelerate more, more basic research, more intelligent basic research? How do we like actually finance that research and incentivize that research? Because right now it's sort of, we can see that and things like NIH are great and they comes up they come up with a lot of great things but could there be a better way than just NIH and um, we've seen pharma in, in essence abandon basic research in my opinion and I think that's a, a really dangerous thing to do I think that to really understand Alzheimer's drug companies have to sort of solve that problem themselves uh, relying on NIH to dole out cash to universities and the universities will go publish the stuff and eventually it'll filter its way to the pharma companies I'm not sure that's a great business model. Um, I think the Pfizer's and Merck's of the world need to actually, you know, dig in and do their own research on, on Alzheimer's, in my opinion. Can AI and robots actually replace healthcare providers? I, I do. I think in many, many ways um, they will or they have. Surgeons won't be replaced by, by robots anytime soon unless you've used a Da Vinci machine by Intuitive Surgical. Uh, but in general, I think like most doctor-patient interactions can be replaced by AI. What's your opinion on Accutane? I took it 15 years ago and haven't been the same since. So I'm sorry to hear that. I assume 
We haven't been in the same since in a bad way. Accutane is, is a really bizarre drug. Um, if anybody wants to look into the history of retinoids, which are vitamin A analogs, uh, they're certainly good for your skin, uh, but they uh, come with a ton of other things. So they're um, nuclear receptor uh, agonists. So nuclear receptors are really weird uh, kind of parts of biology that are, are not well understood. And in essence, they control hundreds of different genes at once. So um, you're really playing with like uh, something very close to like the master switch, the circuit breaker, the circuit board of, of, of biology. Um, and when you play with the nuclear receptors, a lot of things can, can go right or wrong. Um, and so in any event, uh, FXR is one of the other nuclear receptors, but the retinoid uh, receptor is uh, really interesting and uh, uh, how it works is not really well understood. So Accutane has neuropsychiatric effects, liver effects, and of course, skin effects. The skin effects go great. Um, you're, you'll never have acne again um, as long as you take Accutane. But you know all that other stuff is really dangerous. So now Accutane, I believe, has been pulled from the market in many places. Um, there are still retinoid creams, which are a much better way to give the medicine, I would think. Um, but the systemic circulation approach is, is second to none in terms of efficacy. Some people can take it and have no problem, but for other people, they they there are many people who um, will uh, have su you know commit suicide or attempt suicide or have liver failure, all kinds of other things, really terrible depression. I've I've heard it all. The Accutane history of side effects is really 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 wild. Yeah, I'm doing my master's in uh, statistics, and um, I was curious, like, what percentage of uh, research papers do you think misuse the statistical tools? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that. Um, you know I have a love of statistics, and I'm so happy you said statistics and not data data science or something like that. Um, not that those things are necessarily not different. I don't know. People use this phrase data science and data scientists so much, and it, to me it just bothers me because there there is a field uh, called statistics. Um, but in any event, I, I, I do think that a ton of statistics is misused. I mean, the, the, the primary one is multiple comparisons, right? That's probably the biggest sin that gets committed. Um, and then just not controlling for alpha, post hoc observations. I mean, there's just nonstop problems. And then those are inadvertent, right? Then you have like recently in the Alzheimer's community has been rocked by image manipulation, uh, not just accusations, but I think literally just image manipulation <laughs> proof that a lot of the scientific uh, papers, uh, at least by one author in autism, uh, in Alzheimer's, have been uh, clearly manipulated. And I think that's probably more present than we tend to acknowledge or think. Uh, scientific fraud is, is a serious problem. Um, I tried to replicate a bunch of uh, uh, well-known published papers in, in biochem, and I couldn't uh, replicate some of the key papers, uh, which is really frightening. Um, so I think like, you know, there's, there's a lot of manipulation that's, that's intentional. And then, you know, statistical interpretation, that's, you know, really, um, you know, ugly. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not surprised. What do you think? I mean, like, um, okay. So I saw an interesting paper. I, I don't have the link on me, but, um, there's like majority of like scientific results, like have like some statistical error in them on top of that. Like, um, I know people treat like p-value like okay it's like something has a low enough p-value it's like um like fine as far as research goes but like that's not necessarily true because um they could be like misusing like demographics or something well yeah i mean just even understanding what a p-value is and, and thinking about what exactly it means is, is difficult for people um scientists and non-scientists alike and I, I don't blame anybody who doesn't f i mean all scientists get some simple statistical training but as we know from just life in general, like you don't go through uh, a master's degree or a PhD in, in whatever field you're really interested in and love statistics. <laughs> I mean, it's for a lot of people, it's something they hold their nose and they just kind of move on. Uh, but, you know, you can do some basic regressions and things like that, some simple techniques. And you, you, you'll end up, a lot of people will end up interpreting their results incorrectly. And I've seen this a lot with physicians. Uh, it's been kind of the bane of my existence in, in pharmaceuticals where you have brilliant physicians who don't know much about statistics and it ends up being this very, very tough clinical trial uh, interpretation exercise where it's hard to design trials uh, and understand medicine without statistics, but many people will do it anyway. And it's led to a lot of like billions of dollars of waste and errors and stuff like that. So it's real.
really frustrating, but you know, it's also hard. I mean, statistics is one of the hardest <laughs> areas to study. Most people detest their, their statistics courses that they took. Once you get past, you know, mean and median and <laughs> standard deviation and you get into really serious uh, uh, questions, it becomes really frustrating. And um, I don't blame people for not, you know, fully wanting to grab onto it and understand it, I guess. Yeah, but like, so, I mean, there's like a, there's like a famous example with like Linus Pauling where um, he like insisted to like the day he died that like vitamin C like could cure like everything, including the common cold. And, um, but it was because like he um, did a study and like the study was like non representative. Like it only like took like children yeah. from like a certain like ski resort. Yep. But, like, uh, yeah, there's like a lot of like stuff like that. Oh, yeah, there's so many biases in how you design studies. There's no. No doubt about that. I actually have a textbook right here, uh, the Friedman Pisani Purvis textbook on that talks a lot about that as well. Um, so yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean having poorly, poor you know baseline characteristic imbalances or whatever can be the death of a study and the death of a ten or twenty million dollar investment. Um, so there's no no easy way to do it. And I actually think that's kind of one of the things that. I'm hoping get solved over the next 10 or 20 or so years is is doing clinical trials quickly and easily, which so far has been rather difficult. Um, so it'd be nice to to see if that bottleneck could get um, widened a bit because it's it's really the big bottleneck in biochemical or biomedical, I should say, um, research. Are better opiates possible? I don't think opiates um, themselves, using the the sort of opioid receptors that we have and the morpholino structure. Are, are possible, but I do think better pain drugs are possible. And I would point you to Vertex's sodium channel antagonists as potential cures for pain. I know that sounds a little wild, but it is a little wild. Um, what Vertex is doing with pain is, uh, I think could be one of the biggest inventions ever. Nobody wants to talk about pain because it's one of these really, really hard to talk about um, fields. And we tend to have forsaken it and like kind of, you know, labeled it as a dirty sort of dirty word and, and something pharma especially wants to run away from as fast as it can pharma is a bunch of chickens basically i mean i think there's you know after i raised the price of of that drug a lot of people started talking about well you know we, we can't raise prices of anything anymore and we have to be really really sensitive about it and maybe maybe that's the right approach maybe it isn't but pain is something that people have uh, hundreds of millions of people have and, and people really do need uh, patients really do need a solution and in fact, doctors have become a bit chicken about prescribing opioids now to the patients who really need them. Uh, thankfully, Vertex's drug could, could really be the solution. Um, it's one of the most beautifully made medicines um, and the greatest biology ever done. They found a tribe of patients who cannot feel pain. Uh, these are people that have a congenital mutation that renders them insensitive to any form of pain. It's very bizarre. Uh, medicine studied uh, these people for some time, and they've determined that they have a mutation in a protein called NAB 1.7 or 1.8. This is a sodium ion channel. We have a bunch of them, but if you have a mutation in that specific one, you have a so-called channelopathy that renders you impervious to pain. And so anyway, um, you can induce that mutation in people. You could do it genetically or you could do it pharmacologically, probably better to do it pharmacologically. And so I think you can, um, you know, potentially cure uh, pain in a lot of ways. Now, will that drug then have its own dependency and side effect issues? Very well might. Vertex has actually done an amazing thing where they have, are now on their third or fourth version of this drug. And I personally felt that the first three versions they made looked great and there was nothing they should have done. They shouldn't have changed anything. Uh, but the Vertex people really want the perfect drug that has no chance for side effects and no chance for liability and abuse, which I commend them for doing. It's not what I would have done, to be frank. There are plenty of people that desperately need a pain drug that's not perfect. Whether or not you can get the perfect drug in the first place is still an open question. But I, I commend the company for sort of being patient. Um, there are a lot of people who, who are resistant to opioids or the dose of opioids they're on isn't enough uh, and things like that. So I think the company is being a little, not selfish, but short-sighted about those patients. Um, but anyway, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see if Vertex can thread this needle and... Um, you know, a lot of people in pharma are not excited about the Vertex drug because of that opioid kind of overhang that sort of exists. But I think we have to shed ourselves from that and realize that people have chronic regional pain syndrome. People have treatment resistant pain uh, that requires uh, intrathecal, which is spinal cord uh, injection of, of different drugs. 
there are a lot of people with neuropathic pain, which is basically untreatable by, by opioids or anything else for that matter. Um, you know, so ultimately I think, you know, uh, I'm really happy about uh, the development there uh, by Vertex and, you know, potentially not, not another opioid, but just a totally different uh, new signal. So uh, schizophrenia is another great question. I'm so glad you asked that question, uh, my YouTube friend. Um, there are not uh, a lot of great research being done in schizophrenia. The new muscarinic uh, agents uh, are kind of the first big new drugs. So I think between a muscarinic and a atypical antipsychotic, you might actually get reasonably good control of, of psychosis. Um, this is a big breakthrough. Uh, it's coming from this company called Karuna. Karuna decided to take an old Eli Lilly drug and um, do something really neat where the muscarinic uh, receptors, um, depending on how you uh, um, interact with them, you can cause a bunch of other side effects. And so they combined uh, two different drugs to turn up one and turn down one other signal, which is a really neat, uh, smart way to do it. So really, really intelligent. And I think you're going to see a bunch of muscarinics come out and um, improve the lives of people with schizophrenia and probably bipolar disease and things like that. So the problem with the atypical antipsychotics is they work really, really well, but they cause these terrible side effects. And most people I know who have taken atypicals or should be on atypicals really don't want to be on them. And they cause some tremendous weight gain, movement uh, disorders, drooling, all types of stuff like that. So a low dose atypical like Abilify and a potentially the new Karuna drug combined, you could get some really potent, um, hopefully efficacy and help people uh, who have these terrible uh, illnesses uh, get back to normal. I think uh, oh, somebody just mentioned they're starting the Vertex clinical trial. Good for you. Don't tell us too much about that material non-public information.